Welcome everyone to our March Action Conversation on Race. My name is Adele Sholak and I am the Community Engagement Manager in the Center for Race and Gender Equity at YWCA Greater Pittsburgh. Today's conversation on white feminism is an important one and um, we're happy that you've joined us. This conversation identifies pathways to interracial solidarity in service of our mission of eliminating racism and empowering all women. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors that make Action Conversations possible. Action Conversations on Race are sponsored by True Leave, Highmark, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Allegheny Health Network. Thank you so much for your support. Our moderator today is Deja Baker, who is, among many notable things, the lead organizer for Pittsburgh's Racial Justice Summit, and they are co-founder of Pittsburgh Feminists for Intersectionality. Welcome, Deja. Thank you so much for moderating today. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherlock, for that introduction. It's so great to be here. Um, and I really appreciate the invite to moderate today. Um, through my work in PFI, we focus on intersectionality and we use this framework to approach injustices the way that oppression approaches us, which is through a multi-lens, multi-solution and community-centered approach where we center those the least in power. So I'm really great to be here um, to talk with you all about that lens through the work of our panelists today. So today, to guide us in conversation, we are joined by a panel of community leaders who are active in dismantling white feminism. Today, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists, Dr. Sarah Hansen, Etta Cetera, T. Wilhelm. Dr. Sarah Hansen is a partner and principal consultant at Enter Change Group and instructor of gender, sexuality, and women's studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Etta is a board member of Let's Get Free, the Women and Trans Prisoner Defense Committee, and the co-founder of What's Up Pittsburgh. T. Wilhelm is a program officer operations at the Opportunity Fund and an organizer with What's Up Pittsburgh. So let's get started. This question is for all of the panelists. All three of you identify as white. I was hoping each of you could address the kind of inner work that you've been doing um, to divest yourself from white feminism. Please include your pronouns and a description of yourself when you start. I will start with that for me. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a black woman with curly black and green hair wearing a checkered black and red shirt. You can see a purple bag with uh, PFI's logo on the bag. And uh, there's, which is funny, right? There is a white wall behind me. So we're gonna start with Dr. Sarah Hansen um, and I'll repeat the question, uh, which is, could you address, could you tell us how you're addressing inner work within yourself that you're doing to divest yourself from white feminism? Thank you, Deja. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Hansen. I use they, she pronouns. I am, uh, I have auburn hair coming up to a point in the front of my head, a uh, very short, and behind me uh, is a tapestry of blue, gold, and pink swirls. I'm wearing uh, a lighter blue button shirt with a dark blue blazer. And to answer the question, I'll say, um, over time, as I was engaging in equity-oriented work and education, I began to notice more and more how little I attended to the roles of race and racism. As I began to participate in organizing across the city of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, I saw it more and more in real time. I had these 
big, maybe academic understandings of racism, but I had not allowed myself to interrogate it, how it showed up, however overtly or subtly in myself, in the community I grew up in, in my daily interactions. So after a few years of working together, my business partner and firm co-owner, who is a Black woman, was preparing a Building Safer Spaces training and asked me if I would be willing to share some examples of how I had internalized white supremacy. After sitting with this for a couple of weeks, I wrote a list and I just wanted to share a couple of my big ones. I can selectively choose when to appear or disappear into a group or crowd for my comfort and safety because I look similarly to most of the members. I can use stereotypical perceptions of white women as weak, frail, and needing protection to get decisions made in my favor. I've been in moments where giving in, crying, or even flirting allowed me to maneuver into a more positive outcome for myself. And those moments are real. I am not saying they aren't, and I'm definitely not telling people to do whatever works to get them you know, out of an unsafe situation. You need to get yourself out of an unsafe situation. That said, I've used this in situations where I was uncomfortable, not unsafe, and that's different. And in some ways, it's a dangerous practice because it relies on inequity. What happens when I'm not the target, but my Black colleague is? Will I have the emotional and mental strength to step up and call out or call in based on the situation? Will I take a stand or will I shrink back? So to help me realize these tendencies in myself and begin to work to unpack and change my behavior, I signed up for anti-racist practice circles. One series is for practitioners. Another is an anti-racist practice space for white people seeking to act in allyship and specifically also to understand how our family histories influence our understanding of our personal embodiments of whiteness. These are hard discussions involving a lot of vulnerability and intense work, self-work outside of the meetings. So I also found an accountability buddy in these spaces, a fellow white person who is equally committed to doing the work intentionally. So we'll connect now and then to share personal accounts, like support one another, and just hold each other accountable to our anti-racist, anti-oppression practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to pass it off to Edna now. Uh, can you tell us about some internal work you've been doing to divest from white feminism? Sure, Deja. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Etta. I am in a room that is exploding with art behind me. I have, I am, I identify as someone of European descent, D-I-S-S-E-N-T, which means I have white skin and I have a pie face, large green eyes, five foot tall, and I have uh, dangly silver earrings on today. Um, how do I divest from white supremacy? Um, what is the internal work that I do? Um, Well, you know, definitely committed to the ongoing study. I mean, you have to, you have to, I have to, and we all, we all have to continue to study, um, make a point of it. So um, I've participated in study groups, political education groups, um, specifically on racism and racial justice. I do that with uh, people who are white and then also in racially diverse groups. I think it's important to like not just be in the white caucus, which what's up, um, which stands for working and healing to abolish total supremacy, undermining privilege. Um, what's up is a group um, devoted to loving and challenging and supporting white people into doing that internal work and also taking action. So those, I think those white caucus spaces are really important, but they shouldn't be the only thing that you're doing and nothing should be the only thing. Um, one should be doing a lot of things. So there's like the, you know, every year I'm like, what am I doing? What am I gonna do this year? What am I studying? What am I, who am I a part of? Every year I do that. Um, also, like Sarah mentioned, like having an accountability buddy or just like being in community where you can, you know, if you have a situation that's racialized, you know, maybe maybe somebody's brought a way that you've behaved in a racist way to your attention or there's a conflict at work. 
I think it's really important to have white people to lean on that you trust their politics that will help you work through it so you're not um, taxing your friends and community of color to help you process that stuff. I think, um, so yeah, having having someone to help you work through your, your internalness um, is important. Um, how do I, yeah, I guess I think about in, in terms of like the reflection, um, I like to think about spheres. And of course, I'm not the first one to think about this and everything I've said has come from another's mouth and it's just coming out of mine now. Um, so there's like, you know, your personal, your internal stuff, you think about that, what can you do? How do you change your mind? How do you decolonize your mind? Then there's the like, my phone's blowing up, excuse me, I have it on silence, but it keeps ringing. Um, then there's your friends and your family. How are you taking action? How are you thinking about, and this is the internal, this is this is how I do it internally. So you're, you think, you imagine these fears, yourself, your friends and your family, your neighborhood, what is close to you? How is racism showing up in there? How is white supremacy showing up in there? Then you go on to the outer sphere, which is like the, the workplace, the groups that you're a part of, the organizations, the um, institutions. And then it like goes out and out. And I think like part of that internal reflection is like seeing what I have control over what I can change, where I can change. Um, and all that is all a part of like the internal responsibility, the, you know, seeing yourself in connection to, um, to it all and how you can strategize and you can't strategize by yourself, but yeah, the internal part is where you got to start, change yourself to change your world. Thank you so much, Emma. <laughs> I think that was very well said. Um, you know, kind of looking at the inner scope and then pushing out and to work in smaller spaces and then work into larger spaces. Um, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, now, T, if you don't mind ask, answering the question about how you're doing inner work to divest from white feminism. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I am T. Wilhelm, she or they pronouns, um, white bodied femme of center human, also with super short hair, and there's increasingly more flecks of gray in there every day. Um, today I'm sitting uh, where I've been zooming for years now on my bed in front of my headboard, what happens to be sort of a shag carpet on the wall, and there's a green wall behind me and a poster with dandelions, which I find inspiring to all of this work. Um, so glad to be here. And gosh, Edo and Sarah, what you both shared, just so much ditto and, and just many things that I had thought to say have already come from you. And just like you said, Edo, like everything that we're sharing is coming from so many dear humans that have supported us, touched us, helped us move through things. So many Black women, I can't even. Um, so, but just this this inner work, I think, is just really, really key. Um, I think about sort of my journey and like a big part of it started in Edda's backyard, like showing up to some of those first um, what's up gatherings that we held and then just really being involved in that space and those study groups for many years. Um, there's the work um, of Tema Oken, who's um, created that white supremacy culture and especially the new kind of reiteration of white supremacy culture still here that I just go back to over and over again. Like how are those things showing up in me today? How did they show up an hour ago? Like it's so constant um, to sort of really keep keeps being in that wrestling of how the things that that are socialized into us from the moment we were born and started breathing this air and this the society that we're in um, how can we keep just wrestling with those things seeing them more clearly choosing other ways um, and a lot of that then I think I just have been in so many spaces like both of you said of of learning and growing white kind of caucus spaces, multiracial spaces, just, just so many over the years. And there were times I think with the inner work and that, that kind of deep self-reflection can get really hard. And there have been times when I really sort of struggled with my own sort of self-worth and 
and being and and it took a whole lot of then working through really kind of compassion based things for all of us for myself for fellow white folks for the whole of all of us beings who are in this mess that got created um i've found you know so much of my journey started with learning and that will always continue and then these last few years like the body based practices have become essential to me like i can't i've 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 learned that I can't unlearn all of this. Like it is so stored in my body. It's stored in how I was socialized from how I was born. And those stress responses that come up through the nervous system, like so much of the harmful practices are coming from that place. And so um, if we're not sort of actually doing the body work, those those like really harmful things that white women do are gonna keep coming up. Um, so therapy, nervous system response, embodied practices, somatic work, like those things have been so key um, to just then be a human that's in every day, every decision, every conversation, like trying to move towards justice, liberation, anti-racism, all of the things. And because it is, it's moment to moment. It's every, it's everything everywhere all at once. Great Oscar winning movie, by the way. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's, that's what I've got for the moment. Thank y'all. Yes, great movie. Thank you, C. Um, you know, and I also did want to say I appreciate you not just talking about the intellectual work that you're doing, but also talking about how you're doing work to de-escalate yourself before you step into spaces. And I think that's really important uh, to keep each other safe and to keep diverse persons safe in these spaces. Um, so now I'm going to move into a question uh, that is specifically for Dr. Hansen. Um, so I'm going to try not to deviate too much, but in light of um, some things that are going on uh, locally, you know, I wanted to say that you are an academic um, and you do a discipline in women's and gender studies. Um, and what would you tell the audience um, for the context of understanding of what white feminism is? And the piece that I will throw in is we see what's going on with Pitt right, right now. And I think that that um, in light of your focus and teaching and gender studies, uh, what role do you think white feminism may be playing in this situation in which we do have people um, who have been invited by certain groups to speak at Pitt um, and how that you know kind of informs the way that the community is reacting and the way that the community um, is kind of developing around that in the university setting. I know that's a lot, but you know, it's it's unfolding right before us, right? And I feel like you're a great person to kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So I I, I thought about this um, from my background, which is also largely in workforce development in the area, which definitely overlaps with education. So I'm going to respond from that perspective, though I think there's a lot of overlap here with what's going on. At, at Pitt right now. So I'll share that one of my first introductions to feminism was the book Feminism is for Everybody by the incredible scholar, activist, and Black queer woman, Bell Hooks. So I have always held in my heart that definition of feminism. She says, simply put, feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. And to me, there's no accident that that final word, oppression, has zero modifiers. Feminism is anti-oppression. So for me, from day one, feminism has to mean anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-transphobia, anti-homophobia, anti-ableism, and so much more. Environmental justice, social justice, these are all parts of feminism. Um, from my experience, though, white feminism tends to focus in on individual agency, so navigating within the existing system. So because of this, those practicing white feminism tend to, consciously or not, rely upon and reinforce existing systems of oppression, especially ones rooted in white dominant culture. So uh, one example that I, I look to often is the gender pay gap. So ignoring for a moment that our that the, the, the related problem that our current data practices erase the experiences of gender expansive non-binary and transgender folks. So ignoring that for a moment, we have the data that talks about the pay gap and says it's persisted for decades. Consistently, the most common three responses among for-profit and non-profit entities trying to address this issue are one, let's fix individual women. 
they're the ones with the problem. So we'll give them the skills. We'll encourage them to be more confident, brand and sell themselves. That will solve the problem. Or number two, let's embrace feminine leadership as a style. Men get all different kinds of leadership, but women embrace your femininity, whatever that is, and own it. Or three, let's hire a woman or a member of the global majority, which is um, our firm uses member of the global majority to refer to uh, all the folks in the world who are not white. So it takes a strengths-based approach instead of putting it in opposition to, to color. Um, so we, we see hiring of women or members of the global majority to head human resources or diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. They're under-resourced, and it's it, it it's the expectation is that they're going to solve all the hiring, inclusion, and retention issues that are happening. None of those solutions, and I would add, think about this in the context of what's going on at Pitt right now, none of those solutions puts the impetus on the organizations themselves to be accountable for creating more welcoming and inclusive spaces, policies, and cultures for diverse workers to thrive in, or it puts all the impetus on a single person or a very small group of people who are under-resourced. It also lumps all women and female presenting folks into a single group. So one of my biggest issues is shortcutting. This is an unfair shortcut. We cannot shortcut the human experience and we keep trying. So reducing diverse groups into a monolith is the fastest way to ensure that your intentions and your impact will not line up. We are all in this together, yes. And we all have different needs and experiences. So differences of identity and experience matter and deserve to be appreciated and closely understood. White feminism carries the trappings of anti-oppression, but it resists embra embracing the systemic, intersectional, and all-encompassing perspectives and work needed for real change to happen. It tempts white folks by promising equality without too much uprooting work. It offers low-hanging fruit and lets us think, oh, I can convince my company to sign on to this. I can convince my school team to do this. But white feminist resi feminism resists examining impact across intersecting identities. It supports binary either-or thinking rather than accessible, expansive, both-and thinking. And it allows white women in particular to avoid examining our personal behavior and biases. We can sign on for a women's equality initiative thinking we're doing something for the good of all, when that something is often only advancing white women or white people. And so in any decision-making moment, if we really haven't done our due diligence in understanding the impacts on different groups based on identity, background, position, then we are not acting in accordance with true feminism as I understand it. Again, rooting that in Bell Hook's definition of striving for an oppression-free, equity-centered society. I hope that touches a little bit on what's going on. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that you um, you responded really well and I really appreciate you bringing up Bell Hooks, um, who also is kind of the, the founder of this idea of interlinking systems of oppression, um, which it sounds like you were uh, touching on that, you know, these things do affect people in different ways. So working towards equity, right, is working towards fixing those things all at once because they exist all at once and the power that they are given is the fact that they exist all together. Um, so thank you so much for that perspective. And I just wanted to um, ask our other or panelists, if you had anything to add um, to what uh, Dr. Han um, Dr. Hansen was saying. I think I'm mostly going to go back and listen to what you said like five more times. It was brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> well, I'm not going to force anyone to have a response. And there are plenty of things to talk about today. So Edna, I actually have a question for you. Um, so you co-founded What's Up Pittsburgh, um, otherwise known as Working and Healing to Abolish Total Supremacy, Undermining Privilege. What's Up is the collective dedicated to supporting, encouraging, and challenging white people to work for racial justice. So what are some of the common challenges that white women, including yourself, face in their anti-racism efforts. Thanks, Deja. I'm also noticing Joy's question in the chat about breaking it down 
white feminism for maybe breaking it down a little bit. Um, and I just think about like, I, I was telling my friend who was gonna be on this panel and um, they were like white feminism. They were like, that's a, and he's a black man I was talking to. And he was like, that's a, that's a bad thing. And I was like, yeah, it's like, um, I'm, I'm like, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, you think about, I think I was like the suffragettes, white, you know, white women trying to get voting rights um, but didn't have a racial, we're actually anti-Black, didn't have a racial analysis, wasn't including everyone. And then I think about the history of white, what, what I understand is to be white feminism, or and I think about the word carceral feminism, um, where, you know, there was the outcropping of, um, you know, let's solve the problem of do domestic violence by create, by more policing, more um the solutions of the problems in white feminism white feminism solutions to social problems are not um thinking of everybody and a lot of times they those those ideas and solutions ex, you know create more harm um don't include trans people don't include black voices don't include pe other people of color um, and then thinking about to the question that you asked, Deja, of like, I would say frustrations or um, problems that I see in um, white feminism. So like, there's, and I'm, I'm thinking, I, I'm a white woman, I'm thinking to, this is like to other, there's a lot of rules for us. We're asked to, to follow a lot of rules. And a lot of those rules are in conflict. So don't talk white woman don't talk you talk too much you take up too much space white woman if you don't talk you're racist you are not you're not doing enough so there's a lot of these like and there these messages aren't that clear they're more subtle they're in comments they're in conversations they're there and then some of them are actually to-do lists of how to be a good white person and i think that like um you know i have this banner which is hid, hidden by another banner, I would show it to you. I have this banner um, that I created called, it says dwell in the contradictions. And that's a quote I heard from Angela Davis um, at a lecture. And I love that quote. And I made this banner for my birthday. And it's like, you know, a challenge is to white people to dwell in the contradictions, to not take things personally. You know, it's like, don't take things personally. It's not personal. But you have a personal responsibility. It is personal. It's like it is personal and it's not personal. It's like all of these things are all the time happening. So you really have to. That's just one of the struggle. Also, like white fragility coined by, you know, the controversial Robin D'Angelo. White fragility has been a useful framework for me, like the, the fe fear. People are afraid of being racist white women, everybody, we're stepping in it. We're smelling it. We are racist. We can't, we can't actually help it, but we can help it. If you are not um, committed to racial justice, then you're part of, you're part of the problem, you know? Um, but the, the fear of criticism of, um, of, of saying the wrong thing, that's a problem. Um, the, also another problem is digesting all the workshops, all the books, consuming, consuming, you consume, but you never take any action. Where are you? We need you. You need to join an organization. Join everybody. I don't care who you are. Are you a part of an organization? What are you doing? We have so much work to do. Please get involved in something. Um, I, there's a there's a lot of problems, Deja, because I got some more written down. There's like the, the dynamic of the helper and the helpy white feminism, capitalism, racism, the heteropatriarchal, blah, da, da, bell hooks is, I've been trying to make a song of bell hooks synopsis because it's so poetic and I want to say it all the time. Um, the, I feel like capitalism, so you talked about the victim offender binary, Sarah, or like the, not the victim offender binary, but the binaries. And I think about the victim offender binary all the time in the in the world of trying to end mass incarceration and how the state needs the victim and offender. The state needs the victim to prosecute the offender. And, and it plays out such a learning experience has played out in my 
in my companionship and communication and relationships with people who have participated in, in, in survived violence and how we heal from those individual. And then you think of historic harms and historic violence, the state profits from the helper and the helpy. I can only see myself in relation to helping you. We have to undermine that and understand that our liberation is tied with everybody's liberation. So when I'm doing racial justice work, it's not to help black people is to help all people you know it's like that helping i do this to help others we really have to internalize is for ourselves and until we really do that it's problematic we show up problematic all right i'm, I'm gonna pause there no that was great thank you so much Ida. um you know and i appreciate ending on that note of our liberation is tied with everyone's liberation um, which is this idea of equity, right? Um, that if we fight for everyone, no one is left behind. Um, and that kind of ties into what it seems like has been a theme for everyone today, right? Which is that the systems of oppression, which I will just say over and over again, um, in honor of bell hooks, that they work together. And if we work together to tackle them all at once, then we work to tackle them for everyone. So I think that's super important. Um, and so many other things you said that I, I don't want to take up the time to respond to, um, but I do want to give the other panelists an opportunity uh, to add or respond to anything that Etta said. So feel free to unmute and kind of jump in if there's anything you'd like to add. Sarah, do you have anything? <laughs> Yeah, Etta, you're, not you're yet. Right. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, Etta, like there just is the way you were pulling in so many threads and and there's so much. So yeah, there were there were things coming up along the way, and then you moved to something else, and then I was with you on the something else. And so we'll come back and tie all these things together. I'm sure. No worries. Um, I did see. I have a question in the chat. Um, for Etta, it says, what are your specific challenges and do you have an example to share of how you worked through one? Um, I asked for a little bit of more information. Um, hopefully that's enough for you to answer the question. Well, I mean, I, I guess one challenge I'm thinking of, and I don't know, like, this was like another thing. So a challenge for me, and I'm thinking of my radical white community here when I'm thinking of this, this is like my people who I know have good, that I believe have good politics and their heart is there. They're like on the, they're, they're well on their racial justice journey. And one of the challenges there is that people need a lot of handholding. Like, um, and I, and it, it that's a, just a challenge. I'm just like, we need, can you help, can you, you know, and I, I'm trying to think of a specific thing, but um, a, like a more specific example. And I just really struggle. I struggle with that just like in leadership in general, like yes, mentorship, leadership, um, but there's something specific in the white, specifically on racial justice where people, are so afraid. And I think like, how do I deal with that? Well, I've, I'm venting right now. Thank you. This is healing. Um, no, but I mean, I, I talk with uh, like other people who um, are kind of in the same role as I, as I am and we strategize and we don't give up. I mean, honestly, that's the antidote to every problem is not to give up, to try to try to move through the world with integrity. And even like that fear of making mistakes, like that's the problem. Like people are afraid of making mistakes. It's like, you know, when I get, when I get, and when I'm in a conflict and I don't know what to do and I'm freaking out and all these different things, I am like, take a deep, I take a deep breath and I'm like, how can I move through the world with integrity? And I really think about it and then I try. And it might be wrong and I might mess up, but I know that my commitment keeps me able to handle the problems because without my commitment, it's like, where do you, I just, 
So yeah, how do I deal with the problems? I just stay committed and don't give up. Don't give up on anybody. That's the thing too, like Central Park, Amy, this, is, this was probably for the last question, but Central Park, Amy, who called the bird, y'all know who I'm talking about? She was like the white, there's this, there's this tendency for white women specifically to tear the crap out of other white women and white people. Stop that. You see Central Park Amy calling the police on a black bird watcher. Don't make fun of her on social media. Get her phone number, call her and invite her to your organization. We have to love Central Park Amy, love her into the revolution. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, <laughs> for that perspective. Um, so I actually wanted to go on to T and ask you, um, a question. So the YWCA is deeply committed to racial healing. And this is something that you're invested in as well. Would you like to talk about the role of white people in racial healing, especially given the harm that white women can and do perpetuate within feminist spaces? Yeah, definitely. And it just it connects to everything that has come up in this space. Um, I think the the place of healing that I'm, I was thinking about where um, Ed was talking earlier about how everything connects, like our internal work to then our families, to our organization, you know, like it's all such a fractal, right? And so all of it is connecting to everything else. So if we want to get to reparations, to land back to like the big, 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 big capital letter healing, like all of that other smaller scale stuff has to happen too. Um, so I'm just always thinking about all this all the time. And, and so if it comes back to some of that really personal stuff, it is like addressing all of the fears that come up that Edda was talking about. And like, I was even thinking about like, Hey, saying yes to this conversation, I'm like, I didn't want to, but I did. I'm like, I can risk, I can be in the space. Like my risk and putting it having a little bit of fear is so small in compared to what we're working on here. Like, and and all of that, that like that not taking it personally, Edda said, like again, like we are one piece of this much bigger picture. There's so much more harm happening to folks. Like we can be in these spaces, we can push for just like there's just there's so much we can do to work through that. And so I think about the times when um, if healing is also connected to like accountability and repair, right? Like, and there would be so often that we as white folks need to be accountable, need to be there for repair. And there are times in my life when I've been called in and again, to connect back to Etta's like checklist for white women, right? Like I maybe did some of those things or, or didn't do some of the things that are really harmful, but I also like froze. I was in that nervous system freeze response and that like wouldn't let me just sort of really have the openness, have the like deep connection, have the energetic space to really be with folks that were like, and so we could be in the grief of like how these patterns show up in us over and over and how they continue to perpetuate harm. Cause it's grief for all of us, right? And so like all of that healing, like that, that internal healing really like spirals up to all of the bigger stuff. Um, I'm loving, I'm, I've only like grabbed it, but I haven't read it all yet. And I've heard some talks about Kara Page and Erica Woodland have just released a book, uh, Healing Justice Lineages. Um, and so I think that piece is gonna be so important, like thinking about how a lot around healing in white culture, in white women's spaces has become all of this kind of self-care individualistic stuff when I think everything that we're all talking about being it is so interconnected and is so much about like the big picture that we are part of that we are in right and so all of those things are important Reverend Angel Coyota Williams amazing teacher just like talks about how like we can't be accountable if we're not in our bodies and so like I hold that as part of this work is like I want to be a human that's accountable I know I'm gonna mess up again I know I'm gonna like you know do what Etta said and keep trying keep trying keep trying and then I'm gonna mess up and that's I am fully human and that is what that is all about um so all of those things to me are sort of what I've been thinking about around the healing and things. And I just think about too, like how much more space in our organizations and our groups of all kinds there could be for all kinds of healing work, for grief, for, for just like the care of the humans to be humans and take care of ourselves and each other in such interconnected and beautiful ways. Um, 
Yeah, and so I know, I'm sure there's many other ways that all of the kind of racial healing shows up for many other folks, but those are kind of the entry ports, points that I'm really kind of jazzing on at this moment and really thinking about how, how they affect everything else, indeed. So, I'll pause. Thank you so much, T. Um, really appreciate you talking about not just like internal heal um, healing, but also how um, you use that as community healing and in spaces where uh, you possibly um, freeze or are having a hard time. Um, it kind of speaks to what Edda was talking about, about how that internal, um, just kind of working on the, uh, the divestment from feminism starts inside and then you radiate from outside, right? Um, and then that healing touches people in those spaces as well. So I really appreciate that um, from you. Now, um, if anyone doesn't have anything they'd like to add, um, I actually have a question for all of the panelists. Um, so we're gathered together, you know, as part of the YWCA's monthly action conversations on race. So the purpose of these sessions is to inspire action, which I know Etta touched a lot on, um, especially with the question in the chat. So thank you all for sharing your thoughts and experiences with us in your work, uh, within yourselves, within community, um, and within uh, the work that you do, uh, possibly professionally as well. Um, so for our last question, I'd like to ask, what message of anti-racism action would you give to the people, specifically white women, girls, and femmes? And I'm actually gonna start with Sarah, Dr. Hansen, if you'd like to answer that question of um, what specifically uh, anti-racist actions would you give to white people, specifically white women, girls, femmes, and non-men? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. And I also want to express deep gratitude to both Etta and T for talking about embodiment and the role of the body and also for Joy's question, because yes, I, I am so academically minded and part of that is whiteness. <laughs> I tend to try to figure things out. I tend to hear with my brain and my mind first. If we want to move past white feminism to embracing womanism, intersectional feminism, authentic anti-oppression movement, then as people who have been socialized as white women, we must build the body, the heart, and the mind capacity to receive, to receive, to receive the messages when members of the global majority, people of color, tell us we've acted in a racist way. We need to build the capacity to receive that message. We need to deeply start interrogating when and why we cry, when and why we choose to be silent voyeurs watching what's happening but not participating. When we take up space, especially in the presence of Black and fellow folks with historically marginalized races, genders and additional intersecting identities we have to we have to we have to question the ways we've been socialized to respond to difficult moments why are we responding the way that we are we need to learn how to hold space i need to learn how to hold space in myself from my body what am i feeling and why in those interactions, especially when they're uncomfortable, because that discomfort for me is rooted in white dominant cultures. Things like um, whiteness saying, I have to have the perfect answer. I alone can fix it. I can't appear to be wrong in public. I have to be nice. I have to be polite. We need to learn how to express ourselves and navigate those moments of conflict in healthy and restorative ways, asking the right questions, turning to wonder about it, practicing cultural humility, so cultural humility, self-exploration, lifelong self-exploration, self-critique, combined with the understanding that we can never truly know what it is like to be another person or to be part of a group or a culture that is outside of our own cultural humility, asking us to enter into authentic relationships, 
honoring and dignifying those that we are interacting with. It encourages us to abandon tendencies toward arrogance, toward superiority on the basis of anything, skin color, race, years of experience, gender, age, disability, role, position, any identity. White dominant culture encourages white arrogance. <laughs> so we have to challenge rugged individualism. We have to challenge these ideas of that we have to be perfect or the politeness protocol, which is very much gendered as well towards, towards folks socialized as women. We have to interrogate ourselves, read about feminism. Yes, we talked about this, but do it anyway. Read about feminism through the lens of non-white authors. Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, Grace Lee Boggs, Dr. Nicole Hannah Jones, Lavia J. Jones. There's so many. Seek immersive experiences with folks who don't look like you. Practice holding space. What does it feel like to hold space and actively listen to your colleagues, especially those who are members of the global majority and or who are holding historically marginalized, multiple historically marginalized identities. Try to start noticing moments when your impulse to act or your behavior itself don't align with your deeper values around feminism, equity, and inclusion, and turn to wonder about those moments. Why do I feel this way? Why am I acting in this way? What about the way I grew up or the things I learned before are no longer aligning with who I am and what I know today? How can I hold myself accountable to practice anti-racist feminism? You may find an accountability buddy, a white person who is also intentionally on their journey to end oppression. It's, but walking that path of liberation is an everyday thing. And for me, it started with humility. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, that was really great. I appreciate particularly what you said about practicing cultural humility, um, as well as immersing yourself in experiences with people not like you. Um, and I think that really speaks to intentionality, right? Um, there's this trope where we say, if you look at everyone around you and they're all white, there's a problem, but there's not really an action that usually follows that, right? Um, and that's why this these conversations are are on action because the next part is that you really do have to intentionally seek these spaces um, and then also be humble and have humility in those spaces and let people actually teach you and listen, right? So I really appreciate that kind of call to then take that next step to immerse yourself um, into those spaces. And it's not just going to happen by being a bystander, right? So thank you so much um, for touching on that. Um, I'm going to go to Etta now and talk about, you know, what are some actions that you feel um, in white feminist spaces uh, that you can uh, point people towards um, being a part of anti-racist mm. actions. I was all ready to give my message to the young white women of today. <laughs> well, I know, but I'm giving you another opportunity. Use it, use it well. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't help, I gotta say, uh, fight white, I gotta just say to the, just to all, not even the youngsters to everybody fight fight for interracial relationships like Deja said go out of your way build the you have to you have to build those relationships and as Adrian Marie Brown says build them at the at the speed of trust there's no reason nobody should trust you and that's part of the legacy of white supremacy is like we don't come with trust among people of color we the establishment trusts us, the cops trust us, but you have to build that trust and that's a small price to pay for, for meaningful, meaningful relationships. Um, and also study the long legacy of revolutionary white women for the cause, because there's a lot of beautiful white women from the Grimke sisters who were abolitionists to Anne Braden who stood up against the using, you know, white women are complicit in being used by the establishment to subjugate and oppress black people like Carolyn Bryant with the whole Emmett Till thing. But Anne Braden stood up against that and challenged judges. Learn the history. There's a lot of white women, Marilyn Buck, part of the black liberation movement. She went to jail for Asada Shakur. She died. She died. She died for Asada. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful history that we can be proud of. Um, as far as actions to take, 
Um, you know, I want, I want people to, I want white people to be very intentional about the actions that they take, but to not be frozen in silence. And it's like anywhere you are, like T said, there's a place to take action. Ella Baker thought every conversation was an opportunity for a revolution. She didn't take any conversation for, for granted. Um, and Moses, what was his name? Um, the, the guy who uh, was really into the algebra product project, you know, the civil rights, the algebra project where they were teaching math to young black kids because they were forbidden from education or whatever. I saw him speak once and he um, said that Ella Baker, just how um, she cherished every conversation, every conversation was an action, but it was more than conversation. A, a saying in the black community is each one teach one. My friend Kempis Ghani Songster is like, we're way past that point. We need each one teach a thousand. Like we have to, we have, we have to understand that we're living in an emergency. The planet is going to be fine. The planet's going to survive. Is humanity going to survive? And that is what white people are fighting for. Black people and people of color are fighting for their lives. Working class people fighting for their lives. We're fighting for our humanity. You know. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Um, yeah. I appreciate you. You did use the time wisely, Etta. So I appreciate you. you. Um, T, I'm going to go to you. What, what are some actions that um, you would like uh, to talk about as far as doing anti-racist work? Indeed. And I think, you know, again, we're just going to reiterate and touch on any things. A lot of the things um, we were talking about like every moment is a possibility. There's a beautiful sort of analysis around that called choice points that Race Forward has put out. And so that's a thing to look at. It's just like really every conversation, every decision, every small little action like has has like ways to move towards justice and liberation and ways to stay with the status quo, stay with the oppressive systems. Um, so think about that. I, I just think about too, again, because we can't, no, no human can do everything. So really feel for what you're drawn to. What are your skills? What are, what are like, like I, after doing some what's up stuff, I, I became more of a facilitator because that is a thing I can do. Um, other folks are doing such great, like like the political system organizing, which, which I haven't been in as much, but some folks are so drawn to that. Like feel for what, feel for your skills, feel for your superpowers, you know, and like go with that. And then like interrogate them sometimes, you know, sometimes our our superpowers might be really rooted in white dominant culture. And so I can make a mean spreadsheet and I use that very carefully. <laughs> and I, sometimes it really can be used in the service of all of that, right? Um, and just think about the risks that we can take, right? There's so much like when you're when you're feeling like holding back and there's there's something like like question yourself on that like what can you risk how can you move forward how can you push through fear um, all of that is so important um, there's a beautiful uh, training that I'm in right or, or another one of these beautiful white caucusy learning gatherings specifically for white femme identified folks called we are finding freedom which touches into a lot of these things like how are we going to take responsibility for Karen Carolyn Bryant who was so complicit and part of the Emmett Till murder. All of those things, like these are beautiful spaces to like keep going deeper into all of that. Um, keep like reminding ourselves that, that we have such power in like the wisdom of our emotions, right? Like the all, all of our culture needs to bring all of that back. Like, like we, we've got that too. And so like, know that like, go back to like the wisdom that's showing up in your emotions and your body and like, keep letting that be present in, in so many spaces, keep shifting cultures so that that is seen as the wisdom that it is. Um, yeah. And, and Sarah was just holding so much of what you're saying again, it was like, we don't need to know the answers all the time. Like we can't, right? And so like, let go of the need to know, let go of the need to like control ourselves, control other people, like a lot of letting go um, needs to happen. But really like, like find your places, find your organizations, find your people to do the work that's needed. Add, a, add in. I just, speaking of actions, I'm just thinking of a friend of mine who took a job that she really doesn't like in like uh, upper level institution and that totally she's doing that to undermine the institution so she's you know she's in a job she doesn't like because she knows she can have power there 
to change, to try to change things. So you, anywhere you are, you can do stuff. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna like reiterate um, a couple of highlights that you all said here um, as far as action. Um, so I've already responded to Sarah talking about cultural humility, you know, but also talking about um, reading about feminists um, from non-white authors um, and seeking immersive spaces. And I think that was kind of um, a theme here today where everyone's saying, you know, seek these spaces, be intentional. Um, and then Etta built upon that and said, okay, be in these spaces, but don't be the silence, right? And that's actually something we encourage in PFI. Like if you're just sitting there, you know, and you're learning, you're not really learning because you're not engaging um, and you need to engage in those spaces to learn, right? Um, and then we kind of, um, take it a little bit further. And actually, Etta, I really did want to just shout it out the way you phrased that, which is don't be frozen in silence and spaces of action. And I think that that uh, language is really important here to point out. Um, you know, and I think T, what you're talking about here is using those white caucus spaces um, to talk about how you can be a part of um, finding freedom for everybody, right? Um, and using the power and wisdom of your emotions to find your place in those spaces um, as a white woman. So I think that, you know, those are some kind of really important tropes. Um, and um, I, I actually did not finish this last sentence, so I don't know what I was saying there to, <laughs> to come back uh, to you all. But, uh, you know, I really appreciate um, all of those things. And, and I feel like the conversation was able to kind of come together around, um, you know, people being in the same room who really have the same goal um, around breaking this uh, white feminism and really getting ourselves into intersectional practices, which I think that you all talked about without even saying the words. So I really appreciate that. Um, and now I'm going to stop talking. Um, there are some audience questions. And um, if we're all okay with that, because we are running um, at the end of time, I know that uh, we're going to run a few minutes over. So I'm going to ask the first question and try to keep it brief here. Um, so someone asked, it looks like Abby, how can white folks combat this rhetoric of cancel culture and lack of accountability? One thing I love is the work of Mia Mingus around transformative justice and like just, you know, really simple and beautiful posts, blog posts that she put out years ago around like how to give and take an apology, <laughs> like, like, and the way that that will keep sort of moving us forward. So that's, that's one resource and human to, to follow and, and to be in around that. I just really don't appreciate cancel culture. I mean, to me, cancel culture is not abolitionist. I'm a proud abolitionist. And it's like, I don't, and I was thinking about like, when you cancel someone, they're still here. You're just mm -hmm. ignoring them. You're, that's what you do to people in prison. That's what you just, they're still here. You just put them in a box somewhere. It's not dealing with the problem. And, you know, even, and I'm thinking people that I don't like, you know, it's like, what's her name? Wendy Williams. She was like a local journalist who, um, I can't, she would said something really, really problematic, really, she really, really upsetting. She was like, I can't even remember exactly what it was, but it was like very upsetting. And she was immediately fired. And I was like, what a lost opportunity. What a lost opportunity to have an actual real conversation about race. Um, I do think people should get fired. It's, I'm not saying like, don't fire people. I definitely think a lot of police should be fired. You know, people should not, you know, it's, it's not that we're so quick to jump on, jump on people because that makes us feel like, oh, there's like a whole, like, um, and I've, I've been jumped on. I've been, um, the, and it just, it's like the, the social media, it's an interesting phenomenon with social media how it just like clusters and it's, it's like swirl and it's a whirlwind, it's pouncing. It's almost like pariahs. Let's get the person who messed up and not have the real conversation. Have the, I guess, 
have the, but I, I am not, it's like, so Carolyn Bryant, the Emmett Till, the woman who was involved with the Emmett Till, the murder of Emmett Till, she's still alive. She's never been held accountable. I just saw an article this morning. I was looking her up. She was found, she was not indicted, whatever. It's like, what are we as white women doing about Carolyn Bryant? Like, are we just going to cancel her? Like, she, we need to call her. Like, how could she take response? She's not dead yet. She could still take responsibility. She could, you know, you, Carolyn Bryant, you can still take responsibility. You could still have integrity. And the police, I don't believe the police in prisons is the way you do that. All right, I'm just going to, accountability. It's a lifelong conversation, whoever asked that question. <laughs> and restorative happen. practices. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually going to say that, you know, like, what is the place of restorative justice, not even just restorative practice, but restorative justice, right? And that space would be to hold somebody accountable, right? And teach them while also restoring the relationships and the harm that they've caused and the things that they've broken, you know, because I I half agree with Etta, right? I was really happy when Wendy was fired, and be honest, but I, I do believe that <laughs> I do believe that it doesn't stop there right you know because we we don't need someone in spaces like that that have a platform right but we do need to find a way to restore that brokenness and the way that they were educated that then came out and the way that they learned you know something I wanted to say today that I skipped right is that white feminism is learned it is not innate you have the option to not be a white feminist and I think it is our roles to teach people to not be a white feminist. And I hope that's why we're all here today. Um, I'm off my soapbox now, but yeah. And, and I think that you all have such a role in teaching people how to not be a white feminist by the actions that you already do. Um, and so I'm so grateful that you all were able to share that with me today and share that with our audience. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close out. Like I said, we are a few minutes over. Uh, please stop me if any of you had anything to say before I close out. No, but I just did want to thank our panelists um, for being informative and having like a stimulating conversation and discussion with us today. Um, and once again, the YWCA Action Conversation on Race is presented by True Live, or True Live, I always mess that up. <laughs> Hi, Mark Blue Cross Blue Shield and Allegheny Health Network. So thank you for your support and join us next month on April 19th to discuss cannabis and racial justice. So thank you so much everyone for being with us um, and hope you have a good rest of your lunch time or day. So thank you all. <laughs>